4.2 addition rule and multiplication. Key concepts in this section, we present the addition rule as a tool for finding A or B, uh, probability of A or B, which is the probability that either event A occurs or event B occurs. And we're also going to present the basic multiplication rule used for finding the probability of A and B. So to me, the key here is when you see the word or, a lot of the times you think about adding. And when you see the word and, a lot of the times you think about multiplication. Now, of course, the English language still applies. So sometimes or just means or, and sometimes and just means and, but I'm talking about within the context of event A and or event B. So think about it within the context for uh, finding probabilities. Or is add and is multiply. A compound event is any event combining two or more simple events, like A and B, A or B, something like that. The addition rule uh, is the probability of A or B. Sometimes you'll see different symbology used, different textbooks. It looks like a letter U kind of for union. Some of you may remember that from a different class. I've had textbooks use uh, kind of a V shape. I've had textbooks use like a squared off one like that. All three of those symbols mean or. I think this book is going to use the word or. That's what I've seen so far anyway. But the probability, check out this formula, the probability of A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B at the same time. All right. Sometimes we'll think of the word and as meaning both of them happen. Okay. You might have seen Venn diagrams before. So like if you're talking about a Venn diagram, the most common one that we see looks something like this. Okay. A or B essentially is talking about one or the other or both. Okay. One or the other or both. That would be a or B. A and B would be that intersection in the middle. Disjoint or mutually exclusive events. A and B are disjoint if they cannot occur at the same time. So um, this, this picture that I just drew was not disjoint. If you can have if you can have both A and B at the same time, if there's overlap, that's not disjoint. Disjoint is going to be like, you've got some in this set over here, you've got some in this set over here, and there's no overlap, meaning you can't do both things at the same time. Disjoint, mutually exclusive. Example one, disjoint events. Give two events that are disjoint, all right? So how about this? Event S is, um, we're going to say it's X such that X is a senior in high school. And event J is going to be all X such that X is a junior in high school. All right. Is there anybody that you can think of that would belong to both sets? Is both a senior and a junior at the same time? I don't think that's possible, right? Okay. You've got a bunch of people that belong in this set. You've got a bunch of people that belong in this set, but they can't do both at the same time. Disjoint. S and J are disjoint. Give two events that are not disjoint. Let's call event F all X such that X is female. And let's call set D or event D, whatever. It's X owns a dog. Can you think of anyone that does both of those things and checks both of those boxes at the same time? Sure, you can be female and own a dog at the same time. So, you know, there, there might be some females who don't own dogs. There might be some people that own dogs that are not females, 
but we're talking about people that are both female and own dogs are, are in that overlap, okay? So those two sets are not disjoint because there are some people that can do both at the same time. Rule of complementary events. We, we saw this come up in the last lesson, but um, basically this is talking about something that is and something that is not whatever the set is these people do this one thing these people do not do this one thing okay uh raise your hand if you're taller than six foot raise your hand if you're not taller than six foot okay um you know something like that either you are or you aren't that's going to add up to 100 percent of the people all right um i should have said six foot or taller not taller than six foot um i kind of like this version of the equation better but all three of those equations say the exact same thing. Example two, sleepwalking. Based on a journal article, the probability of randomly selecting someone who has sleep, sleepwalked is 0 0.292. If a person is randomly selected, find the probability of getting someone who has not sleepwalked. So the way I look at it is we want the probability of someone who has not sleepwalked. And so using one of those formulas before, we can just say it's one minus the probability of someone that has sleepwalked. This is a fairly straightforward application of that formula. Um, it's going to be one minus 0.292. And that is 0.708. We're finding the complement. Complement is everybody else. Multiplication rule is kind of hard, I think, because it introduces a symbol that you may not be comfortable with or familiar with. The vertical bar symbol right here is a little bit tricky for most people. So it's the multiplication rule. It says probability of A and B. Um, in other words, um, they both occur. But notice this language, it says event A occurs in a first trial and event B occurs in a second trial. It's kind of, um, it's kind of important to note that A happens first and then after that happens, then B happens second, okay? So here's this formula right here, probability of A and B, it's probab probability of A times the probability of, here's how you read this, the probability of B given a that's how you read that all right so don't shortcut that don't make up your own uh way to read that that's how it's that's how it's read that the vertical bar is usually read as the word given and that means we're finding the probability of b knowing that a has already occurred that's what that means it's called conditional probability and we'll talk more about that later probability of b given a represents the probability of event b occurring after it is assumed that event a has already occurred now i know that's kind of hard to imagine so let me give you an example try to paint a picture here okay so All right, so I've got these five numbers here, and I'm going to randomly select one of the numbers, okay? I'm going to randomly select one number. Can you tell me what's the probability that I select an odd number? Say it. Three-fifths, right? Three odd numbers out of five numbers, three-fifths. That's perfect. That is the probability, okay? Now... What if I change it slightly and say, I want to find the probability of an odd number given that I'm only looking at the circles? It's different. You've got this extra information. Probability of an odd number given that I'm only looking at the circles. Who can tell me what that probability is? Not two-fifths. I'm only looking at the circles, right? And so if I'm only looking at the circles, it's not two-fifths, it's two what? Two-thirds. It's two out of three, okay? And so that's a, that's a tough, 
that's a tough thing to understand, okay? But knowing this extra background information changes my probability. It changes the problem. It changes the numbers. That's conditional. That's, that's what we're talking about right there. So assuming that event A has already occurred. Intuitive multiplication rule to find the probability that event A occurs in one trial and event B occurs in another trial, multiply the probability of event, of event A by the probability of event B, but be sure the probability of event B is found by assuming that event A has already occurred. So, you know, that's, that's just kind of rewording the formula right there. And we're, we're essentially just multiplying. We're multiplying, but you have to assume that event A has already occurred. And then there's independence. Two events A and B are independent. If the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the occurrence of the other. Um, you know, flip a coin shows heads, 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 heads. You flip that coin and it shows heads up 20 times in a row. What's the probability that it's heads up on the 21st coin flip? Still 0.5, right? It doesn't matter what happened before, okay? The, the thing that happened just now doesn't affect it. It's still 0.5, okay? Because each of those trials are independent of each other, all right? Now, it's very rare. It's, it's probably not going to be the case that you flip 21 heads in a row, but that doesn't matter. If we're looking at the 21st flip, that probability is still 0.5 because those events are independent of each other. So several events are independent if the occurrence of any does not affect the probabilities of the occurrence of the others. A and B are, if A and B are not independent, they're said to be dependent. Okay, so independent means one doesn't affect the other one. One doesn't affect the next one. Example three, screening drugs and the basic multiplication rule. 50 test results from the subjects who use drugs came back showing 45 positives and five negatives. A says if two of these 50 subjects are randomly selected with replacement, they bolded that because it's kind of important, with replacement, find the probability the first selected person had a positive test result and the second person had a negative test result. Okay, so I'm finding the probability that the first one is positive and the second one is negative. Now, essentially, we're going to multiply two things. Okay, so we're going to multiply basically the probability that the first one is positive times the probability that the second one, oops, probability that the second one is negative, okay, given that the first one is positive. That, that was our formula. That was our formula from before, okay? So probability the first one is positive. I think that's the easy part. First one is positive, part over total. We know there are 45 positives out of 50 total. Okay. So that, I think that part's the easy part. It's 45 positives out of 50 total. And then the next one, uh, we're going to have to think about a little bit more. Okay. Probability that the second one is positive given that the or second one is negative given that the first one is positive. Okay. Um, I, th I think this this with replacement is kind of the key here because we're taking that first test result and we're put it back putting it back in. So that means there are still 50 things that we would have to choose from. Okay. So you kind of, I mean, I don't know how much this really plays into it. The fact that the first one was positive after we replace that result back in the pool. Imagine like a big, you know, a file folder or something that's got all these, these 50 slips of paper in there. And, you know, you took one out and it was positive. You had 45 out of 50 chance that that was positive, but you put it back in the file. Okay. You put it back in the file folder. What's the probability that that second one is negative? Well, it's just five negatives out of the 50 total 
papers in that file. Five out of 50. Okay. So um, weird fractions, maybe I'll just uh, multiply it out. 45 over 50 times 5 over 50. It's 0.09. 0.09. Okay. So equals 0 0.09. Now, part B says repeat part A by assuming that the two subjects are selected without replacement. So the difference is I've got a file folder. I pull one out. It's positive, and I sit it on the desk over there, and now I've only got 49 in my file folder. Okay? So it's, it's kind of the same thing, same formula, equals probability that the first one is positive times the probability that the second one is negative given that the first one is positive. The probability that the first one is positive is still going to be 45 out of 50. But without replacement this time changes the problem. I've got 50 papers in the, the thing, 45 out of 50. I take that one out. I put it on the desk. Now I've only got 49. So what's the probability now that the second one is negative? Well, there's still five negatives, right? Out of 49 total pieces of paper in that, that file. So it's different, slightly different. With replacement, without replacement. So now I've got 45 over 50 times 5 over 49. About 0 0.0918 approximately 0 0.0918. 0 0.0918. Sampling. In the world of statistics, sampling methods are critically important and the following relationships hold. Sampling with replacement selections are independent events. Independent events. Sampling without replacement selections are dependent events. So remember what you know. Remember what those words mean. Independent was like one thing doesn't affect the next thing. Okay. Dependent, one thing definitely affects the next thing. Okay. That's why it, the second one had, was over 49 and over instead of over 50. Okay, 5% guideline for cumbersome calculations. Cumbersome, you know, cumbersome means the numbers are, are big and huge and gross, okay? Um, heavy calculations. When sampling without replacement and the sample size is no more than 5% of the size of the population, treat the selections as being independent, even though they're actually dependent. I think that's kind of hard to understand, okay? Um, but cumbersome calculations, this is going to be useful for us because we, we, it'll, it'll just simplify our lives quite a bit. Example four, drug screening and the 5% guideline. Okay. Assume that three adults are randomly selected without replacement from the... 2 million or 247 million and so, or so adults in the US. Also assume that 10% of adults in the United States use drugs. Find the probability that the three selected adults all use drugs. Okay. So notice this word sampling. Okay. And let's talk about the sample size. The sample size is no more than 5% of the size of the population, okay? So in this case, that's the sample size. We're taking three adults out of 247 million, okay? So did I say two? Three. We're taking three adults out of 247,436,830. Our sample size is really, really small. Is that less than 
three people less than 5% of 247. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely less than 5%. Okay. So less than 5%. What that means is we can treat this as being independent. Okay. And that really, that really helps us out. All right. So we treat this as independent. We want to find the probability that the three adults all use drugs. Okay. Well, there's three things. And so I like to think of it as, as like a blanks problem. There are three independent events and the probability of any one of them is going to be 10%. So we're going to have 10% times 10% times 10%. Or if you're ahead of the game, you can think about it as 10% as to the third power. Point zero zero 0.001. That's the answer. Okay. Now... I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you why this cumbersome guideline or whatever is is kind of nice, or rather super nice. Technically, we treated these events as being independent when technically they're not. Okay. If you think about these three things multiplied together, 10% 10 of 247 million is just knock off that zero. It's gonna be 24743683. That's 10% of 247 million, uh, 436,830. So, so basically, to get that calculation, to get that 10%, we would have that fraction right there. That's the first individual. Okay. That's the first individual. So, you know, think about without replacement and think about what we did in the, in the previous example when I took a piece of paper out of a file, all right, we're taking one person out of this group of people. And so for the second one, we would have 24,700, no, 24,743,682 to look at. I just subtracted one over 247,436,830. Nine people in the population to choose from. Okay, this is without replacement. That's the second value. Now we're going to multiply the third value. We just subtract one again. So twenty-four million seven hundred forty-three thousand six hundred and eighty-one over two hundred forty-seven million four hundred thirty-six thousand eight hundred and twenty-eight cumbersome. So you multiply all that out. I am not going to type that in. Okay. Once you multiply all that out, I've already done that. It turns into about 0 0.000999, 000 blah, blah, blah. Okay. It's essentially the same number, right? 001, 001. But man, that is what you call cumbersome. So the rule is if our sample is less than 5% of that population, just treat them as independent. It's going to be a lot, lot easier. 0 0.001. That's the answer. This is the answer. Okay. Redundancy. The principle of redundancy is used to increase the reliability of many systems. Our eyes have passive redundancy in the sense that if one of them fails, we continue to see. An important finding of modern biology is that genes in an organism can often work in place of each other. Engineers often design redundant components so that the whole system will not fail because of the failure of a single component. Redundancy. If one thing breaks down, something else kind of picks up the slack. Number five. So you'll notice on your uh, printout that I made a mistake and didn't type in everything. So you might try to fill in uh, 
what I what I missed. But here's the uh, the whole question. Modern aircraft are highly reliable, and one design feature contributing to that reliability is the use of redundancy, whereby critical components are duplicated so that if one fails, the other will work. For example, the Airbus 310 twin-engine airliner has three independent hydraulic systems, so if any one system fails, full flight control is maintained with another functioning system. Assume the probability of a hydraulic system failure is 0.002. Part A says, with only one hydraulic system, what is the probability of the Airbus uh, 310, uh, what's the probability that that flight control works properly? Okay. So remember, this is, this is failure, right? We want to find the probability that it does not fail or it works properly works properly, does not fail. We're going to go back and use that complement rule. So one minus probability of failure. And so in this case, one minus the probability of failure is 0 0.002. One minus 0 0.002 is 0.998. Or in other words, a 99.8% probability that it works properly. Okay, that is with only one hydraulic system. But as mentioned above, this particular plane has three independent hydraulic systems. Okay, so it's still the same equation. We're still we're still saying we want to find the probability that it does not fail. So we're going to do one minus the probability that it does fail. But in this case, when you've got three independent hydraulic systems, what do you think we're going to do? One minus, how are we going to calculate the probability of failure if there's three of them? Anybody? What? Multiply by three, good guess, not quite. Not multiply by three, but we are going to multiply. System one has a probability of 0.002 of failure. System two has a probability of 0.002 of failure. And system three has a probability of 0.002 of failure. So, so we are multiplying, but we're multiplying 0.002 times itself times itself, or to the third power if you want. Okay, one minus 0.002 to the third power would probably be easier to type in on your calculators. One minus 0 0.002 to the third power is that. Or, I mean, I guess I kind of skipped a step, maybe. I mean, nines is that, that eight nines there. If you multiply 0 0.002 times itself, times itself, that's going to be um, eight zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. We have one minus that, okay, which is 0.999999. What was it? Nine, nine, eight. Oh, 992, of course. There's your answer. Would you feel comfortable flying on that plane? 99.999992% probability that it's going to work properly? Yeah, I think so.